Thanks for clicking on the video and here today at Nerd Mimic, I'm happy to present to you my complete set of Red Sonia novels. These wonderful books were published between 1981 through 1983 and there are only six in the whole series. These were published by Ace Books and it came out during the time of Conan the Barbarian uh, hitting its full stride with the two great movies with Arnold Schwarzenegger starring in it and of course the comics uh, featuring stories by Roy uh, Thomas and these were commissioned all at the same time as Red Thomas and along with the artist uh, Barry Smith uh, created the Red Sonic character to complement to Conan the Barbarian. Uh, we'll get a little bit more into that in a bit, uh, but uh, part of the reason why I have this set is uh, for this module here, RS1, Red Sonia, we went over recently. There is a suggestion of novels to read and yes it's this entire ace book line one through six so um i reread uh book one recently uh i didn't have time to read all of them i think that would maybe take a little too long uh but i'll give you a little synopsis of each one in a bit uh before we do that uh the res sonia character first was created once again uh, as a complement to the Conan the Barbarian character. We talked about these issues. Um, her first appearance is actually in Conan the Barbarian, issue 23 here. However, it is part of the story Shadow of the Vulture, which the cover was uh, on issue 22 here, and the story was actually supposed to be in here, but it got delayed for various uh, editorial delays or whatnot that they alluded to, and so the actual story is in here, which has a different cover by a different artist, uh, as Barry Smith was one of the co-creators of Red Sonia, and he didn't even do the cover for this one. Uh, so anyways, uh, and then the, her first full appearance here is in Conan uh, 24, and of course it has a wonderful Barry Smith cover as well, so these are supposed to go hand in hand and once again uh, this was uh, I believe by Gil Kane who is a great artist by his own right but once again not the actual creator of Res Sonia. Um, anyways uh, the origin story of Res Sonia is not in the actual Conan the Barbarian comic book. It's actually detailed in the magazine and part of the reason for that is because the comic codes authority and her story of course involves uh, being assaulted and raped. And uh, they do detail her origin story more in depth in the first novel here. Now, before we take a look at all six books and their wonderful covers, uh, we should talk about the authors here. And they're all commissioned by the same uh, pair of authors, David C. Smith and Richard uh, Tierney. Now, David Smith, he's well known for starting a novel series featuring a character called Oron. He's a Conan the Barbarian type character where sword is mightier than magic. And Richard Tierney is known for writing a lot of uh, Lovecraftian Cthulhu uh, stories. And so he's adept at uh, doing fantastic goal horror type descriptions and uh, it really uh, is a nice pairing as the stories are quite well done the descriptions uh, the battles are uh, quite uh, detailed uh, definitely more of an r-rated type story uh, just because of the violence there's a lot of decapitations a lot of horrific monsters that they encounter and as you may know uh, in the vein of sword and sorcery and magic wielding characters are usually the main bad guy. Now, the other thing we should do is appreciate, of course, the wonderful covers we have here. All six books are illustrated by Boris Vallejo, who is a Peruvian artist, and he's still alive and kicking and uh, doing art now. Now, uh, my favorite uh, cover artist is Michael Whelan. I don't have heard of him. I'll probably have to do a little video about that one day. Uh, and Boris Vallejo, you can see here, He's uh, well known for doing detailed portraits featuring muscular men and women. And certainly that lends to the barbarian sword and sorcery atmosphere of this uh, book set. So let's take a look at this first one here. This is Red Sonia, number one, The Ring at Ikribu. And we'll talk about this more in depth. I've re read it recently. 
Uh, you can see here, you got Red Sonia here, you got some undead uh, monster here, and uh, she got the sword at the ready, and she already has her uh, trademark uh, bikini outfit. So her, the Red Sonia character uh, was created in 1973, and uh, this uh, novel, once again, uh, was published in 1981. So sure, character has already been developed uh, well in the comic book uh, run. And so, um, but this novel, once again, this is a great starting point though, for people that are not too familiar with the mythos and want to get into it. Okay, so this is uh, book one. We got book two here. This is Demon Knight. And you can see here Red Sonia countering a specter of some sort there. Pretty cool looking cover. This is book three. When Hell Laughs. You can see Red Sonia slaying some foe here. Got some blood on the ground. And here is book four. This is Enderthrall's daughter. And this is probably the best cover of the bunch. Um, I sort of like her in repose here. Um, sword at the ready as always. But, uh, but I think this is uh, the most uh, beautiful, uh, well done cover of the bunch. This is book five, Against the Prince of Hell. And you can see some fantastical creatures here. And then the last book of the bunch is Star of Doom. And you can see she's getting ready to slay this magic user here. All right, so there's all the covers there. Uh, let me just show you what they look like side by side with the spines. Um, so once again, published by Ace Books. And uh, it always gets me when there's not any uniformity uh, I'm not sure why this one is red and black, red, red, black, red. Uh, and then of course they're all black here and this is uh, uh, red here. It's a little bit uh, bizarre. Uh, these are all the first editions and they were all commissioned at the same time. Uh, in fact, you could see here in the first book, once again, this is a first edition, but they already had uh, probably the first five novels written as once again they were all commissioned at the same time from my understanding and but the sixth book was not titled yet okay so we're going to set these other books to the side and we're going to talk now more in depth of this first novel now you might be asking yourself why is this novel important this first one the ring of ikribu um there is a little more to this story of than just the novels being created. This also was the template for a unproduced screenplay, hopefully for the first Red Sonia movie. Unfortunately, that never came to be as they didn't use the screenplay by David Smith and they went with a different one. And uh, as you know, the Red Sonia movie that came out in 1985 uh, bombed at the box office. Uh, it was probably more than just a story, of course. There was uh, um, problems uh, locking in uh, the Conan rights uh, to have that character in the movie and uh, other things as well. Um, but unfortunately, they never used this story, and it is a fantastic story. Now, before we get into the story, as I mentioned, there is more in-depth information here about the origin of Red Sonia, and that is partly because of the Ford. Uh, written by Roy Thomas, the creator, uh, Red Sonia, along with uh, Barry Smith, the artist. And he basically uh, states here, you know, uh, the Conan character was quite popular. However, the female characters, uh, they came and went, and there was no uh, consistent uh, female character lead, and they wanted to establish one. And so they took the story of Shadow of the Vulture, which was a period piece, that featured a strong uh, female character uh, set in, in the 1500s, and they uh, transported her uh, and uh, restructured her to fit in the Conan the Barbarian, uh, Hiberian Age. 
And they also mentioned um, her origin as far as uh, being assaulted and raped and how that led to her determination uh, to become a great fighter. Uh, and not only is that once again detailed in the Ford here, but that's uh, even uh, elaborated on within the story itself. But this is a really good Ford to read. Um, maybe if there is a PDF somewhere online, you could just check it out. It's a pretty nice summary here. Okay, so on the back, we get a little sense of what the story is going to be about. She lived in a savage world in an uncivilized age, ruled by men and governed by sword. They called her Red Sonia for her flame red hair, for the smoldering fire of her pride, which gave her sword arm a strength that few men could match and none have ever defeated. In the very lands where Conan the Sumerian wielded his powerful blade, this beautiful and deadly warrior mate traversed the Hibernian kingdoms with her sword for hire, Lured by promises of riches and adventure, Red Sonia is drawn into a war between a city of doomed mortals and the awesome ambitions of a century's dead sorcerer in a quest for the primal untamed power forged into a ring of gold, the ring of Ikrubu. All right, so that is the set for this story. Now, unfortunately, there are no other illustrations within this book itself, so you're probably just going to have to listen to my voice while I elaborate more on the plot. So apologies, there's no graphics to go along with this at all. So the novel starts off with a three day long rainstorm that's drenching the kingdoms. And at one uh, tavern full of mercenaries, there is a soldier trying to recruit mercenaries to fight for a lord. So this lord turns out to be King Olin and he rules a country that was recently devastated by evil sorcerer uh, Aztoth. And the uh, machinations of this evil sorcerer, uh, he basically is trying to acquire power as most evil doers will do. And he recently learned of this ring of Ikribu that holds a uh, great power and he wants to uh, get the ring himself and uh, control its primal forces. As this uh, was um, created in the time of gods. Now, one of the subplots is this evil sorcerer has uh, recruited this duke, Pleiades, and has tried to have him acquire this ring by raiding various countrysides, but the duke has failed to do so, so far. And at the very start of the book, he uh, curses uh, the Duke uh, by altering his face into some horrific uh, manner. Um, and that's where the Lovecraftian uh, writing comes in hand. And uh, he's a, a horror to behold. So he now has to wear an iron mask to cover his face. And um, the Part of the subplot is he uh, now wants to um, go against the sorcerer and he wants to seek the ring for himself, not bring it to the sorcerer, but use the ring to protect him from witchcraft and to uh, kill the sorcerer himself. Going back to the tavern, uh, this recruiter cannot find any mercenaries to fight for Lord Olin. Uh, however, uh, this is when Red Sonia, of course, makes her appearance. She um, opens up the door. She's all drenched wet. She has a cloak on. They don't know who she is, and they don't even know if it's a, a girl or a uh, male. And uh, basically, uh, the recruiter is spouting uh, lines of to recruit and promise to be paid well. And Red Sonia is, well, you know, okay. You know, I need money. I just spent three days out in the rain and uh, she is looking for coin and uh, will uh, lend her sword for pay. Now, most of the other mercenaries don't want to do that as they don't want to fight against a uh, magic wielding uh, foe. And, uh, but she is not afraid to do so. So Red Sonia joins up with the Lord Olden's army and there she encounters the Duke who once again has uh, turned traitor to the sorcerer. Uh, 
and she learns of the uh, desire of the Duke to acquire the ring, and that is also the main goal of the sorcerer and why he is attacking the nearby regions. Um, so there is a lot of adventure to be had when this army, basically, they're going to march to uh, where the sorcerer's lair is. And uh, as they progress, uh, yeah, they're going to be attacked by multiple magical uh, undead type creatures. And there's a lot of decapitations and limbs being severed in these battles. Um, and uh, you will see magic being used and uh, reference as just being evil. Uh, the closer they get to his lair, um, the more other uh, soldiers will have uh, visions of uh, horror and they might even uh, commit suicide or attack other fellow soldiers um, and there are still undead attacking them. So a lot of fighting, uh, but it's really well done, pretty fast paced. Um, it still holds up well, uh, even after reading it uh, over the uh, past week. Um, I certainly would uh, recommend you give it a try. Now, as they progress and get closer and closer, uh, this army, uh, which I think was uh, at least 5,000 strong, gets whittled down to just uh, like 30. And uh, finally, they are able to enter the lair, but one of the sorcerer's creations a underwater uh, monster uh, drags the Lord uh, down and kills the Lord. And so that really takes the morale out of the uh, soldiers. And Red Sonia, who has uh, grown very fond of this uh, Lord and uh, actually uh, falls in love with him. Um, they never have sex or anything like that, uh, as uh, once again, she is not uh, allowed to do so unless uh, she gets defeated uh, by uh, that individual in fair combat. And, and actually, uh, one of the side stories here is that Lord uh, decides to fight Red Sonia just for this purpose, to better. Uh, but yeah, she uh, uh, basically kicks his butt. Um, so anyways, um, this Lord has uh, died and drowned, and uh, they basically have lost. And during this process, one of the shrines they visit, uh, Red Sonia was able to obtain the ring of Ikribu from one of the cultists. This ring uh, basically gave Red Sonia some protection to some of the hallucinations and magic being used uh, at the army, but still uh, she is not completely invulnerable. Um, she wanted to give the ring to the Lord uh, to protect him as well, but it was a little too late and once again he has died. So basically the army, uh, the reigning army and Red Sonia decided to um, abandon their uh, crusade and uh, retreat. Um, the Duke though, he still wants to kill that sorcerer. And he says, okay, Red Sonia, you know, I've, I've, I've wanted the ring and you, you tried it your way. Uh, give the ring to me and I will kill the sorcerer. Um, they, uh, she doesn't trust him. However, uh, they have tried their best uh, to attack uh, the sorcerer's lair and cannot over overcome his defenses. But yeah, maybe he can because he was an insider and uh, maybe he could pretend to give the ring uh, to the sorcerer and uh, backstab him. However, once again, they're not sure of his true intentions as once again, he was a lieutenant for the sorcerer and he might just give the ring to him, right? So basically, uh, Restaurant has decided to put it to a vote to the army and everyone decides that, yeah, let's just give the ring to him because uh, we cannot do anything else. And um, they uh, decide to head back to town and treat their wounded. And as they're making their way back, they feel a magical weight lift off their shoulders and they could tell this horrible uh, feeling of dread that was in the forest and the surrounding area has just magically gone. And they could just tell uh, in their hearts that the sorcerer must be dead. And so Red Sonia has decided to um, 
and several of her uh, soldiers uh, loyal to Lord Ulrich had decided to go back to the lair to see exactly what happened. And when they enter the center of the sorcerer's lair, they do find the sorcerer dead at his throne. They also see the duke uh, dead on the floor as well. Uh, he does have the ring uh, on his finger, and you can see the sorcerer has like a, a sword that's been thrown and uh, impaled uh, him to the throne. So the duke was true to his word that he was going to slay the sorcerer, but in typical um, Hollywood-type fashion, uh, that sorcerer is actually not dead. As you can see, the body of the duke sort of stirred, and they think maybe, oh, he's not dead, uh, just uh, wounded. But no, the sorcerer actually has transferred his soul to the body of the duke. As once again, this sorcerer has been living for centuries and has been doing uh, life uh, extending magic such as this and once again a master of undead and so he is now in the body of this duke who is uh, uh, more stronger than his uh, um, prior frail uh, sorcerer body body and uh, so he's quick with a sword and uh, once again it's uh, iron a mask and uh, there is a battle uh, with this uh, undead um, duke uh, but so Red Sonia is able to defeat him. And then one of the last scenes in the book is Red Sonia is taking off the mask of the Duke to uh, give him peace. And then um, as they do so, they realize his curse has been uh, reversed or negated or canceled out uh, because the source is dead. And now he has a regular uh, human face at peace. Uh, so that is the uh, story, uh, Ring of Ikrubu. Uh, it's full of action for sure and uh, worry for your heroes. And, you know, uh, you th think everything's all lost. Uh, but then, of course, uh, there's a Hollywood ending where you, everything seems to work out fine. Then, of course, like a uh, Hollywood movie, uh, the foe is not uh, dead and comes back and uh, they have another battle. And uh, so I could see why they um, translated this to a screenplay or vice versa, made the screenplay first and wrote it as a novel. Uh, sure, it's full of cliches, but you know, it is fun. And that's what we want to have, right? Certainly, I think this plot is better than the 1985 movie. Uh, but you know, that's just my uh, personal opinion. I don't know what you guys think. So this novel is well written and it's done with a modern sense of style. Certainly a lot easier to read than these old Conan comics as Roy Thomas wrote almost like a Shakespearean type of uh, prose with uh, complicated uh, lines uh, and trying to reflect the dialect that they might have spoken back then. But here they speak in um, plain English and it's just so much easier to read than the comics. Um, okay, so thanks for listening to that. Let me show you the other novels here. And once again, I didn't reread any of these recently. However, let me just uh, show you the back of these. Okay, so this would be number two here. And you could take a look at the plot lines. And this is book three, book four, book five, book six here. Now, I don't recall Conan being in any of these stories. It is just Red Sonia by herself in these novels. Uh, once again, they all follow a very similar uh, plot line where Accord, the sword, ends up being mightier than magic. Um, of all the novels here, though, I still think book one is the best of the bunch. Uh, these are not bad. Uh, if you do happen to find them in used bookstores, certainly I would encourage you to pick it up and give it a read. If you had to pick between Conan and Red Sonia, Red Sonia definitely would be a lot easier to get into as uh, the novels are 
more uniform in nature. Uh, there are a ton, dozens of uh, Conan books nowadays uh, and written all by multiple different authors having multiple different uh, um, plot lines. Uh, so this is once again more uniform and once again it's based on the Marvel a comic book uh, origin story, not the new Dynamite uh, comic line. And so uh, it really uh, fits well and, of course, will match the D&D module here. All right, so um, that is, once again, uh, Red Sonia, the Ace paperback novels. And, yes, Ace also published uh, a lot of the Conan novels as well. Uh, maybe I'll do a video of those one day, but uh, this month is going to be, once again, a Red Sonia uh, month. All right, so thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, hopefully, you learned something new. Leave me a comment down below if you've ever read any of these novels before, which is your favorite of the bunch. Um, have a great night, and keep on adventuring out there.